My name is Yao Hill. I'm the uh, assessment specialist at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I earned my PhD in second language studies here at UH Manoa, and my specialization is in language assessment, program evaluation, and curriculum development. I feel honored to give this webinar on outcome development. By the end of this lesson, I hope that you will be able to do two things. First, you'll be able to list the steps of backward design, and then you'll be able to develop meaningful and measurable learning outcomes for your project. What is a backward design? Backward design is a curriculum development method that starts by asking what is worthy and requiring of learning. You know, traditionally, we often start a lesson by selecting a theme and the materials and learning activities. But in backward design, we first think about what should be the learning goal, what should be the learning outcomes. After that, we think about what is evidence of learning, what kind of tasks or performance that students should demonstrate um, in their achievement of the, these outcomes. Then we think about what promotes learning interest and the excellence in terms of materials or learning activities, opportunities, pedagogical approaches, and so on and so forth. So to sum up, there are three steps in backward design. First, we define goals, outcomes, and obje or objectives. And then we define assessment tasks so that we know whether students have achieved the outcomes. Then we develop learning activities to help students to be successful on these achievement tasks, assessment tasks, and show that they have achieved the outcomes. The focus of this webinar is to help you to develop measurable and meaningful student learning outcomes. I define student learning outcome, or SLO, as action-oriented statement of the knowledge, skills, and or dispositions that students are expected to know, to be able to do, or value upon successful course completion. And in your case, that will be project completion. Very often, there are three components of SLO. SLO, uh, SLO almost always start with the phrase, students will be able to, or student can. Um, student can do this. And then followed by an action verb. There are some examples for you, like list, describe, analyze. And you can see more action verbs in this link, which I'm going to put in more to consider um, for you to access. The last component is the learning domain. And in PBLL, we also further classify it in content domain and language domain. Let's take a look at the example. In this example, it says, students will be able to research and describe common leisure activities of people in their community using short, memorized phrases and sentences. So you can see there are four, four things, but three components. Students will be able to, and then action verbs, research and describe. Here is the content domain, and here is the language domain. If you want to put it on the, um, your blueprint, uh, re remember that your blueprint will ask you what are the content knowledge or skills and what are the language knowledge skills that you want to train your students to be able to do. So if we separate those two learning domains, and this is how they would show up on your blueprint. Hi, this is Stephen. Everybody, I have a brief note. If you lost your chat window, just move your mouse up to the green stripe, and you will see chat as one of your options. You click on that once, and your chat window will come back. OK, go ahead, Yao. All right. Now let me give you another example. Take a look. And you tell me what should be put in the content knowledge and the language knowledge on your blueprint. All right, it should look something like this. Students should be able to compare and contrast the similarities and differences in family dining cultures of their native country and another country. So this is the content. 
in terms of language, not only they're using the short sentences and the formularic expressions, but they should also learn about transitional words to express comparisons and contrast. You can see in this example, the language level that we expect out of the students are pretty basic. But in terms of the um, content skills, it's a, it's a relatively complex task than the first task. Compare and contrast uh, represent a, a more complex cognitive uh, task uh, capabilities of our students. So it's possible for, for, to ask our students to do some more complex cognitive tasks. Um, still keeping their language level at uh, the basic level. So we talked about what is a SLO. Now I'm going to talk about how to make your SLOs measurable. One of the most effective strategies is to use action verbs. And you can see some examples here. Try to avoid verbs such as understand, know, um, these vague verbs because you really want students to demonstrate their learning, their knowing of their awareness, their development, whatever. So use the action verbs. For example, if you want students in the end to be, to be able to debate, you may want to use your assessment task as a debate task. This will also help you to organize your learning opportunities and learning activities. So use action verbs will help you to um, organize your thinking about, already thinking about assessment and your learning activities. One thing I want to talk about um, SLO is that often people can confuse SLOs with what uh, the uh, class activities are, what we require students to do. For example, students are required to read chapter four to six. Uh, students will complete five writing essays. These are not SLOs. SLOs really have to specify the knowledge, skill, and or values that they expect out of the students upon course or project completion. OK, that being said, let's move on to talk about how to make your SLO meaningful. One strategy is to think about the tasks in real life that student has to perform that meet some features of PBLL. What are the tasks that is significantly in content, that is challenging and driving, engaging students' 21st century skills, encouraging their in-depth inquiry, and is impactful in the world? Let's take a look at example. <clears throat> For example, this is what Stephen mentioned in his first lesson. Uh, this is a Hawaiian airline internship program for Chinese language learners. So the Chinese students in upper level classes are supposed to serve as uh, interns at the airport and help these Chinese customers doing these uh, tasks. At first sight, there are some salient tasks for the interns, such as listed here. However, if you really start thinking about it, there is a complex context and a relationship between intern and the customer and the workplace and the people that they interact with. So for example, in this experience, first of all, maybe we want interns to develop the self-awareness and social awareness. Make them recognize the benefits of being a bilingual individual and the impact in the world. When they're interacting with customer, they need to develop linguistic and cultural competence because they work at the uh, airport workplace. Not only they need to know the rules, regulations, they also have to develop career skills such as communication, collaboration, problem solving, critical thinking, and so on. When they're dealing with their supervisor and coworkers, they have to think, they have to use the same career skills in dealing with the communication and conflict resolution, but also they have to deal with the workplace culture. Okay, so after analyzing all the context and relationships and culture, dealing with people and knowledge, one of the outcomes that um, I think that they can develop is in terms of content is critical thinking. So we can say something like that. Students will be able to examine business situations and apply airline industry rules and regulations to provide professional problem solving solutions to customers, supervisors, coworkers. Then think about what language skills are needed to fulfill 
this task. Students should be able to ask questions, explain policies, procedures, alternative solutions, clarify ambiguities, pr propose solutions using socially appropriate, polite, and professional language. So that is a task. Analyzing task, but look beyond the surface. Think about the relationship and the context that learners have to immerse themselves in, um, and also think about the PBLL features. So that's the first tip. The second tip to make it meaningful is to think about the learner's cognitive and linguistic development. Let's take a uh, look at a two list of verbs. Think about which list would elicit the tasks, uh, will, will, will represent the tasks that elicit more sophisticated language use. Now, think about which list would somehow cause more frustration if uh, learners are not giving enough um, um, help or assistance in their language production? Well, I hope you select the blue list because this verb represents a task that is more cognitively challenging. Uh, research shows, research theory believes that more cognitive complex tasks will solicit more sophisticated and rich language use, but research also, <clears throat> cognitive linguistic research also believes that there are competing resources. So when learners are thinking about more complex, uh, cognitive, engaging in more complex cognitive tasks, uh, that will compete resources for language production. What does this mean? This means that uh, college learners, you know, in contrast with fifth graders, you, we probably could give them more cognitively complex tasks that is intellectually challenging. However, we just need to do a more scaffolding, which I believe that um, uh, in the, fut the future lessons will cover the scaffolding. Okay. Now, the third tip is to um, align your SLOs with national standards and established evaluation criteria. In language learning, the most widely used standard is World Readiness Standards for, language, for Learning Languages. And I can provide this link in the more to consider. Um, also, act, uh, this standard was published by Actifol. Actifol is working on a publication that provides more detailed standards for um, several languages. I know that Chinese is one of them. So, uh, I provide the link. If you're interested, you can go back uh, to the website to see when they're going to publish the book. Right now, they are still in preparation, but they announced it's going to be published soon. So let's take a look at example of the same airline internship project, the language outcomes that we set up for our learners. This outcome can be aligned with not only the communication uh, standard, in terms of interpersonal communication. It can also be aligned with connections. Let's take a look at what does the connection standard say. It says learners build, reinforce, and expand their knowledge of other disciplines while using the language to develop critical thinking and solve problems creatively. So because our outcome um, is related to critical thinking problem solving content skills, so this fit in or aligned, are aligned with the connection standard as well. Other standards or guidelines for consider is actual profici proficiency guidelines or for those working in the government and um, defense language institute, you probably are more fami familiar with interagency language roundtable. So you can see how your outcomes are aligned with the proficiency uh, levels and skills in these guidelines and standards. One of the most um, beneficial aspects of PBLL is that um, in addition to training students with the language skills, we're also fostering, we're also fostering students' 21st century skills. One of the great resources for you to consider is the World Languages 21st Century Skills Map. In this map, um, hundreds of educators, they provide examples of tasks 
for learners to engage that can foster their 21st century skills and how the language, um, world language training and activities can help learners to foster both language and 21st century skills. Using the same example of the airline internship project, using the same language outcome, we can see this outcome is aligned under information, media, and the technology skills uh, as one of the 21st century skills. Specifically, it is uh, trying to foster students' ability to communicate and critical thinking problem solving skills. Just give me a minute to read through the skill descri description. Okay, so actually what is interesting is that these skills, understanding these skills, what, what the meaning of 21st century skills, will sometimes inform us to develop these outcomes for you to be more purposeful in training students to foster these specific um, 21st century skills. So I do encourage everybody to look at the meaning of 21st century skills and the example tasks in this map. Okay. And another resource for you to consider if you work in the K-12 situation or uh, educational context, you are probably familiar with the Common Core standards, which is adopted by 43 states. If you're working in higher education, context, you probably are familiar with something called value rubric. Value stands for valid assessment of undergraduate education. It's, uh, a rubric is um, basically a matrix that shows the evaluation criteria and a description of performance under each performance level. So in the value rubric, um, they, there are 16 rubrics. Many of them are aligned with 21st century skills. These are what higher education educators, hundreds of them, think what students should be able to perform under each of these skills. Some of, some of the examples provided here, like critical thinking, information literacy, creative thinking, teamwork, problem solving. So aligning your outcome or borrowing from these criteria generated by hundreds of educators across the United States would help us to be more to align our education, our educational opportunities with what is expected out of our students, our undergraduate uh, students. I'll just give you one example. For example, under teamwork, one of the criteria um, is a uh, the person be able to facilitate. Let's read it. Engages team member in ways that facilitate their contributions to meetings by both constructively building upon or synthesizing the contributions of others, as well as noticing when someone is not participating and inviting them to engage. This one is a little bit too long, but we can certainly um, make it more concise and make it into an outcome, and then evaluate that outcome using this criteria. So borrowing from existing standards and established criteria can help us to make meaningful outcomes and also make our job in assessment much easier because it is measurable, it is meaningful, so it is more easy to establish the assessment tasks and the criteria for evaluation. All right, so that concludes my talk. Again, I talked about two major topics. First, I mentioned what is a backward design. It has three steps. The first is to define outcome. Second uh, is to develop assessment tasks. And after that, we think about what learning activities or materials that we can use to foster students' learning towards the outcome achievement and for, uh, successfully complete the task. Then we talk about what does student learning outcome mean, how to make it measurable, and how to make it meaningful. Where I introduce the three strategies. First is to think about real-world tasks. Then think about learner development, development status. Last, and most importantly, to align it with standards and established criteria. 
So that concludes my talk, and uh, I welcome any questions. Okay. Thank you, Yao. Uh, this is Jimmy Oshoka, Program Coordinator at the NFLRC. Um, here is your first question. Uh, when you talked about the two types of tasks, simpler and more complex, is the recommendation to use the simpler tasks with beginning level students since they require lower uh, language abilities and simpler language forms? That is a very good question. Actually, Steven and I, we talked about this. I think you really have to understand the cognitive development of your learners. I would give a much simpler cognitive task to fifth graders, but I would challenge a college learners with more complex tasks. But that doesn't mean that you give them a complex task in the very beginning. Um, I would recommend, I would encourage actually using complex tasks, but scaffold with simpler cognitive tasks in the beginning. So if you ask students to compare and contrast, maybe first you want to teach them the word to describe, and then slowly moving on, teach, teaching them, them some of the transitional words that you can use to help them to make um, the language connections uh, in the comparison and contrast tasks, and to help them to fulfill that uh, more advanced um, task. because. Uh, when you think about how learners engage in the real world, nothing is really simple. I mean, if we only give the lowest level learners the simplest cognitive tasks, they probably would never be equipped. Uh, that is one of the principle of task-based language learning as well. In the task-based language learning, the principle is that uh, you don't have to limit your students, uh, the learning activities into simple cognitive tasks. Actually, we encourage the uh, educators, the instructors to bring in real world tasks. And then we analyze this task, think about what learners need to fulfill the task, and then we just scaffold them uh, step by step to achieve the more complex real world tasks. Hi, this is Steven, and I'm jumping in to say, even though a task is cognitively complex, it doesn't always follow that uh, you have to use complex language to accomplish the task. Let's take, for example, uh, a task for students to list uh, a number of actions that people can do. Uh, a relatively low cognitive level would be make a list. Uh, a relatively high cognitive level would be categorize these actions in terms of ones that are easier for young people and ones that are easier for old people or something like that. That would introduce one level of complexity to the simple task of listing the, the actions. Actually, uh, uh, TOEFL did the research. Um, they're, they're examining the language production between more simpler complex tasks and, and more, com and more com cognitively complex tasks. What they notice through various of linguistic analysis, there's no difference in, in language production. Um, you know, things they use are accuracy, fluency, uh, uh, complexity measures. So I think go for it. Okay, the next question is uh, regarding the standards for higher education, would you suggest only the actual guidelines and not IRL? I are, oh yeah, actually no, I, 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 I mentioned the interagency roundtable guidelines, right? I did, yeah. <clears throat> Um, I would say you first have to think about, especially in higher education, you really have to think about what is require, required out of your institution, um, what is recognized by your, by your institution or by the needs of your students. If your students must fulfill some of the proficiency scale on the uh, interlanguage table, scale, then you use that. So use what is most meaningful for your learners and what is required of your institution, unfortunately. But <laughs> um, yeah, so use what is what, what fits your context the most. And I mentioned the three language standards. The first is the world language. 
the second is the act for proficiency, and the third is the uh, interagency roundtable scale. Okay. Um, the next question is, can a facilitator participate in the project as a learner? I mean, can he or she have a role as a learner too? That is a very good question. Um, actually, in that airplane internship project, what is interesting is that the program, the, the outcome is dynamic, and the learning activities are dynamic, uh, constantly based on the discoveries of what students have to face. So um, I would say, I would say I would say yes. I would encourage that because it shows it also. If you, a uh, instructor, also participate as a learner's role, you may serve as a role model in how to learn. And self growth, um, lifelong learning is a uh, also a very important 21st century skill. What I'm what I'm saying is that maybe, but uh, you, however, you sometimes you want to step out of that role. You just have to make the transition is very clear to your student, so your student doesn't get confused. So, uh, why do you suddenly take authority? Um, you know, when when is your role as a learner? When is your role as an instructor? Uh, in my work, I often serve both as a facilitator of discussion among faculty, but sometimes I also step in as expert. Um, one of the methods that I use is to make a virtual hat. So I'm telling my participants, I'm taking off my hat as a facilitator and to speak as an assessment specialist. So maybe you can think of ways to make that transition easier for you.